from COVID-19, everything has changed and yet nothing has changed for our communities. We see like images of nature coming back. We had been hearing, oh, air quality is better. But here in LA, for low-income communities of color, because we're surrounded by industry, that, that's just not the case. The ports have not stopped, the refineries don't stop. They're continuing to pollute because these businesses are labeled as essential, which leaves our lives as not essential. When we looked at our own backyard, we see the reality of um, environmental racism. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. People exposed to even slightly higher levels of air pollution, it turns out, are dying at significantly higher rates from COVID-19. That's according to a recent study from the Harvard School of Public Health. The way that's playing out in Los Angeles is that while the skies above that city may be turning temporarily blue, on the ground the epidemic is laying bare the disproportionate effects of air pollution and environmental racism. Laura Cortez and Cindy Donis of the East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice are fighting back. Cindy, tell us who you are. What do you do? The work that we do is across different parts of Los Angeles. That includes Oil Heights, East LA, Southeast LA, uh, and Long Beach. And we're working around environmental justice issues. These communities are overburdened with industrial contamination uh, and the impacts of being of that exposure. We, the health impacts include asthma, cancer, cardiovascular, um, other respiratory illnesses. And so we're helping folks understand and create the link between those health impacts that they're dealing with and the things that surround our communities and are embedded with our communities. And we're giving them the tools uh, to be able to advocate to create a better world and a better community um, that they're residing in. In February, before the COVID-19 epidemic hit, I was in LA and got a tour around East Yard from Cindy and Laura. Take a look. You can't sense smell through film, but it smells really, really bad right now in this area that we're at. And that's because in the city of Vernon and then also in the city of Boyle Heights, there's about four plants that are called rendering plants. Any roadkill that is found gets sent to those places. Any um, animals that get killed at uh, shelters get sent to these places. Um, and any dead animals can get sent to these rendering plants to get processed. Um, they get processed uh, to make gelatin. They get processed to make uh, makeup um, and other products that we might not have considered to have animal parts in them, they have them, right? And that's where they get processed to then sent to those companies where they get made. Uh, the reason why we smell the smell is because these facilities leave the carcasses and the dead bodies uh, outside exposed during the day. So we're standing in front of Excite Technologies. Excite Technologies was a battery lead recycler. Um, and so they would have the, they would bring in used batteries, like car batteries, for example, and then they would melt them down through a lead smelter. Um, but what was happening is that they weren't doing it appropriately. And this was since the 1920s through the 1940s, and it went through different ownership, but continued to be a lead smelter. And through um, the smeltering, there was so many decades worth of arsenic and lead that became part of our soil. Right? So even though this area looks heavily industrial, it's actually really, really close to homes. In 2015, uh, Excite was shut down through community pressure. We were told it couldn't be done. It was done. And now we are in the cleanup process, which is another uphill battle because uh, Excite left basically without having to pay anything. And so our communities are left with huge public health gaps. Laura, let me bring you in. How has COVID-19 affected your community? 
everything has changed and yet nothing has changed for our communities. We still have um, a bunch of uh, truck traffic coming through our neighborhoods uh, that has not stopped. The ports have not stopped. The refineries don't stop. Um, so there's continued operations because these businesses are labeled as essential, right? Even though they're continuing to pollute, which leaves our lives as not essential as we're sheltering in place at home. Um, we continue to have to breathe these toxins in, uh, whether it's air pollution, soil pollution, um, and, and our activities, right, being removed or, or reduced, right? But these companies continue to operate full force and are actually getting a lot of passes uh, from the government, whether that's regional, whether that's state, whether that's federal. Um, we're fighting the EPA. We're fighting South Coast Air Quality Management District um, because these agencies that are supposed to protect us are actually doing rollbacks uh, mm -hmm. to not protect us, right? To do quite the opposite and allow these industries to continue functioning. Uh, and they're doing this without any public processes. So COVID-19 is, is definitely a double-edged sword in terms of we are more likely uh, racially because we're communities of color. And reports state there's a study called Race Counts. Uh, which is really important and it directly correlates our race to the fact that we're more likely to have COVID and we're more, more likely to die from COVID. Um, although the curve is flattening, that is flattening for the white affluent communities uh, in the LA area, that does not apply to us. And the, what's happening with the racial trajectories is it increased right by the fact that these industrial polluters uh, continue to get these passes. Many people in the mainstream media and frankly some of our mainstream environmental organizations have been saying that environmental improvement and reduction in emissions is the great silver lining of this pandemic. That's what that's not what I'm hearing from you Cindy. Yeah, thank you for, for this question. Um, we also see like images, right, of like nature coming back to its its original places. Um, but here in LA, um, for, for low income communities of color, uh, because we're surrounded by industry, that, that's just not the case. And so there's been um, preliminary studies that have been conducted that correlate air pollution and contamination and, and then the impacts of COVID. And this data that's coming out is revealing that for people who were exposed to higher levels of contamination, in particular, there's one study that um, connects particulate matter 2.5, PM 2.5, which is what diesel is, um, that the likelihood that there's a higher chance of you to, to get COVID and for COVID to have a deadly impact if you are ex already exposed to PM 2.5, which is all the communities that we listed earlier, thinking from the ports all the way and all the neighborhoods that are along the 710 freeway are already at a higher exposure uh, prior to COVID coming. And now even during COVID being here, um, it's a big reality and it's a big fear that our community members have of um, around COVID in general, but it's another layer of it, right? Because of the air pollution that they're exposed to. What companies are there in East LA, if you were to name names? Well, for, for Long Beach, the big one is the Marathon Refineries. Um, Marathon Refinery, and then there's also the Soto, there's also Philip 66. Um, and so it's a conglomerate of different refineries that are there. Um, and from there, we have the ports, which a lot of the machinery in the ports also run on diesel. There are a few that are zero emissions, but not enough. Uh, and for the 710 freeway, it's over uh, between 40,000 to 60,000 truck trips that happen every single day. And uh, that 710 freeway parallels Long Beach. Um, it parallels with Linwood, with Compton with Bell Gardens, with Bell, with Maywood, Cudahy Commerce. And in commerce, that's where we have um, a lot of warehousing um, and a lot of uh, distribu food distribution centers as well. And so thinking about um, people's access to food, where right here we have community members who don't have access to food or are having to barter between paying for rent or paying for food. Um, we have all these warehouses here, so th this food is coming through our communities, but our, our community members here lack the access to it. Laura, this is business as usual, 
as you said, under COVID. What sort of change are you working for? And can you work for that in these times? Yeah, I think we talk about this a lot at, at East Yard. Um, and it's really twofold. One is we're trying to address the needs of our members now because there are so many needs, the needs that already existed around housing, around food, um, around justice, right around our communal justice system, all of these needs already existed, right? But they are so much more augmented um, and, and magnified right, through COVID-19. And so when we're trying to meet those needs and also our vision for the future, which is not what we had, we do not want to go back to normal. That is not the way it should go. That is not, it was never okay for us, what, what was normal for other people. Um, and so one is this capitalist system, this capitalist system does not work. It is not functional. We need a different system. One that takes into account race equity, one that takes into account gender equity, right? Um, and all these other different different forms, right? Migration, right? As a form of, that is natural and fluid, right? And should not be criminalized. So all these different issues. But in the immediate, we're also just trying to make sure community members have food. We're also just trying to make com make sure that community members have mental health and well-being. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that we have social cohesion, um, within our group, right? Cindy always talks about social solidarity. So making sure that even though we have these physical distances that we continue to communicate, continue to build that community because when uh, the COVID crisis, right, is over, that does not stop the struggle for us. That is not going to be the magic solution to our problems because our problems were already there. So, what do I mean? I'm just going to push you. You are familiar. You do it all the time. Everything at once. The immediate needs and the future plan. For many people, this is a future planning moment, meaning corporate executives are planning. You talked about rollbacks. We could see them carving up a world very different even than it is now. We also need you perhaps also need a plan. Um, I'm imagining you have one percolating somewhere. You're doing a series every Tuesday on Instagram. Um, what actions do you want to see coming out of this, um, assuming we survive as many of us as possible? Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy. Oh, yeah. Whoever you want to go. To, to talk a little bit about the, the sessions that we're doing on Tuesdays. Um, we have a, it's hashtag EYCEJ Toxic Tuesdays. And we created that um, particularly because we had been hearing like, oh, air quality is better, it's improving. And we were, then when we looked at our own backyards and our own communities, we see that that's not the case. And so we really wanted to, to elevate our stories, our community members' stories, and also the stories that we were hearing on a national level from our allies. Uh, that we're also experiencing that same uh, feeling of um, of the impacts of COVID, but also the reality of um, environmental racism. And so I think one thing that we want people to realize throughout this moment is that corporations aren't putting a halt. Like you said, they're planning, they're making big moves, they're trying to decrease regulation so that they can increase their profits um, while still causing harm in our neighborhoods. And so we wanted to, to provide an outlet for community members to tune in and learn about the continued exposures that are going on, whether that be the first time they hear about it and can start engaging, or whether it's providing some sense of relief of like, I'm not crazy, I see it, I feel it, and this is real. Um, so some form of validation. And like Laura mentioned, this is really, a, this moment, even though we've, we've been hearing the, the term social distancing, we have to practice social distancing, where yes, we should be practicing, physical distancing, to, to keep our elders, to keep our, our most, uh, um, our most like immune compromised community members safe. It, it, it completely makes sense to keep physical distancing, but we need to still have some type of fabrication of social solidarity in this moment um, and listening to each other. And so if I hope anything comes out of this um, is that people are really opening their eyes to how our, our government 
has denied access to resources prior to this, but even seeing this moment of COVID as a bigger example of that. Um, that these fa phases in of, of reopening um, and um, reopening different uh, outlets of, of profit in our economy, it's really about corporations still wanting to, to continue their revenue. And it's not so much about keeping us safe. The fact of these rollbacks is not well understood. Um, can you elaborate at all on any of the changes that have gone into place and what effect they're having now or you fear they will have? Yeah, I can speak to the federal stuff and then uh, Laura can speak to some of the more local things. Um, we are as ECR part of a national coalition called the Moving Forward Network and they're keeping us in tune and informed around the EPA rollbacks. Um, we do have a, uh, a sign-on letter that folks can, can sign on to to um, and push the EPA to in to stop their rollbacks and so at a federal level that is what EPA has done they've rolled back on enforcement for some crucial federal and environmental regulations so it's allowing agencies themselves or corporations themselves to be their own regulators um, and that that just means that there's going to be poor regulation at hand happening and so the with MFN, the Moving Forward Network, that's what we're currently pushing is that EPA essentially just do their job um, to not let COVID or to not fight, uh, to, yeah, to not let COVID be the reason to, to roll back, to not use it as an excuse. Laura and lo the local picture? Yeah, so regionally we have our South Coast Air Quality Management District that's supposed to regulate our air quality, but instead what, it is, what this or agency is doing is prioritizing um, and expediting the permitting process for these polluting facilities. Meanwhile, they just announced that they are delaying or postponing um, quite a few, I believe it was 10 policies that would be regulating these polluters. So they have more than enough time to be able to expedite um, the processes that polluters go through, right? But they do not have enough time. They do not prioritize um, these policies that are supposed to protect our air quality and ensure our well being in a time where we're already disproportionately at risk of contracting COVID because it does uh, impact the immune system and respiratory system. We are already. Um, immunocompromised. We already have respiratory deficiencies, right? And so this is what AQMD, right, um, and the feds are doing is completely contrary to what we need in our communities right now. There's been a lot of talk, uh, Laura, about environmental justice, a lot, and environmental racism. And these terms are heard much more now than maybe 10 years ago. Are you seeing a change in the way that the biggest, most powerful environmental organizations are acting? Have they reached out to you, uh, especially in light of this story about a silver lining? I think that we have forced our way in, to be honest. I think it, it's a time where uh, East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice focuses on community capacity for self-advocacy. Um, however, we need to be at the table uh, at a regional level, at a state level, at a federal level, and we have pushed ourselves to be in those spaces. Um, at times, we do have uh, what we call um, main greens, right, or the big greens, um, these larger environmental orgs who are supportive and at times they are not and when they are not they end up stifling a lot of our work unfortunately um, but when they do come to when we do come together it's great um, and when we don't we're still going to push um, and we continue pushing with our allies right that's part of our moving forward network national platform is we pushed our way into the top to make sure that we're heard at that level Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, recently announced that he was establishing working groups on different topics. And he named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Queens Congresswoman, self-defined Democratic Socialist, as one of the chairs of his caucus, his working group on climate justice. Does that give you hope, confidence? Do you have any expectations around that, Cindy? I think uh, that is hopeful, that that is 
that environmental justice is one of the, the topics of conversation, that there's going to be a group on it, um, that doesn't change the work that ESERT is going to do on the, on the ground. We're going to continue with our local agencies and pushing our local agencies to do more and do better. And if that report or any policies that they create through that group um, that come through, if we can leverage those to, to uplift the work that we're already doing, that will make our work more powerful. But until then, we, we have to continue doing this work here locally. The two of you seem quite calm <laughs> and as always very collected and clear, but you gotta be raging and you've got to be exasperated at this dissonance between your reality and the reality people are seeing on their TV. Can you talk to us about that for just a minute? Yeah, I mean, I have my moments. Um, right here, I'm calm and connected because we're being recorded and we're doing this interview. <laughs> um, but this is hard. I think some of the hardest conversations that, that get to me are the ones with members who are, are struggling. I, I'm very fortunate to, to have a team um, and both like through work and through East Yard, but then also here at home um, and with my family where we have good communication and we can support each other. But for undocumented community members who maybe they're the only family here, that they don't have that network. We are like East Yard is that network, right? Um, or for community members who are financially struggling and are having to use their credit card now, like to pay for everything. Um, we are that support system. And so some of those conversations are, are heartbreaking, but it also, it enrages me, yes, that our communities are in this situation. Um, but what uplifts me is knowing that I can do something, that as East Yard we can do something, and that there's other amazing people who are providing so much mutual aid in their communities. There's, um, there's different community members who have just started their own fundraisers to support then more community members in their cities. Um, and so th those mutual aid efforts that I'm seeing come through, um, through social media um, and through different portals on the internet, that would, that's what gives me hope, that our communities are resilient and we can figure out how to, how to provide support for each other mm. in whichever way that means. Laura, to you, if we were to, or you were to take a peek inside your heart right now, what, what would you see? That's a that's an interesting way to frame it for sure. Um, yeah, I think I I am always angry at something. There's always something to be angry about. We joke um, as the East Yard team uh, because the factors right we have never been in our favor. Um, and I think despite that, we have had generations previous to us right like my immigrant family that came here right. I'm sure it was not easy for them. And yet we found silver lining within that. And I think we, we continue in that with this, with us, right? Um, as the East Yard team is, yes, of course we're enraged. And that we funnel into the, the drive and motivation to continue pushing. And we live for the moments when, when a member makes a connection, right? We live for the moments when, when a member makes that first call to a city council meeting saying, I cannot pay rent and I need you to help me because I deserve that. Right? And I think those are the moments that, that take us from anger into power, right? And that's the difference between anger and power is there's something in between an action that happens. Um, and that's, that's what we live to do. How can people help, Laura? There's so many levels of help. Um, I think folks who have financial needs or financial abilities need to support financially. Right, whether it's to East Yard, to an immigrant coalition, um, to whatever that group looks like, you need to support our folks, right? This is not charity, right? This is social solidarity that has been needed for generations and that our communities have been in, in a deserving mode for generations. Um, in terms of policy, we need these policymakers to get it together and prioritize us, right? Just because we're not in that council meeting with them or that agency meeting to hold them accountable doesn't mean we're not watching, doesn't mean we're not lifting our voice, and doesn't mean we're not gonna hold those receipts and hold them accountable. And so we need them to get it together before they end up, we end up in an even harder disarray and dissonance, right? For us, right, for Mother Earth, right? This is, this is not sustainable for us. 
Thank you. Is there anything you would add to that, Cindy? There's an array of, of petitions going around also. We have two in particular. One is around um, our Southeast LA communities having um, access to to homes. So like making sure that rent and mortgages are, um, forbi or are forgiven right now um, so that they don't have to pay it and also don't have to worry about having somewhere stable. Uh, because financially our community members are struggling. In addition to that, the petition is also asking our city council members to stand up against ICE and immigration because earlier on in particular with the stay at home ordinances, we did see ICE come through our neighborhoods, particularly in Bell Gardens and kidnap some of our community members just straight up here in our neighborhoods. And so we were our demand is also to have city council members from the various small Southeast LA cities to make a statement um, and additionally to improve access to uh, food in our communities and access to um, health and wellness, particularly COVID testing places, which we've seen improvements on, but it could also still be better um, in our neighborhoods. And then the second one is around, uh, is through the Moving Forward Network, which I mentioned earlier, a, a sign on letter um, pushing the EPA to, to get on with the regulations and still um, hold companies accountable. And so we can send you those links uh, also so that you can help share the word for those. It'd be great for social solidarity for the Southeast LA one if people don't live here, right? But for the EPA one, it impacts all of us at a national and international level also, because the air is not stagnant, it moves. We are connected. Thank you so much, both of you. I appreciate so much you taking the time.